Now, what about the spectrum? Uh, I know the spectrum you can get with LEDs is going to be different than a lot the traditional HPS, for example. A lot of people claim that the HPS is a close closer spectrum to the sun than any LED is. Talk to us about like the spectrum differences between LEDs, what you can get out of LEDs versus what you can get out of some of the other traditional lighting. So uh, each semiconductor creates one wavelength of light. That's it. So a 660 nanometer, you know, semiconductor creates photons from like 655 to 665 nanometers, but they're all right in this really narrow little range of spectrum, right? Um, the 450 nanometer semiconductors are, are almost exactly at 450. So like every photon coming out of that, they're monochromatic. They create one color of light. Um, and, and, you know, the earlier generations of LEDs used blue diodes and they used red diodes and in sort of conjunction. Um, and, and that's why, because you have semiconductors that create blue light and you have semiconductors that create red light. There are no semiconductors that create, quote unquote, white light. White light is the combination of several different spectra. So you have photons at different wavelengths all can, coming together that create white light. And interestingly, you don't need a lot of all of the different lights. You can have a lot of red and a lot of blue. As long as you have some greens and yellows, the light looks pretty white. If you only have red and blue, it, the light looks blurple. And, you know, growers that have been around the block for a few years know what blurple light looks like. It's It's not sort of a... It's certainly not white and it's not pleasant. You can't really see your plants under it very well. And that was one of the big problems with, with blurple light. So what they do to create white light or white diodes is they start with a 450 nanometer blue semiconductor. And then they use phosphor in the glue that sort of holds that semiconductor. And that phosphor distributes the, the energy to the other spectral brands. So they're able to sort of what you're basically doing there, blue photons at 450 nanometers have a lot of energy. Red photons at like 650 to 700 nanometers have less energy. So when you push those blue photons through a media like phosphor that sort of strips them of some of their energy, some of those photons become redder and it sort of diffuses the light through the spectrum to create that white tint. Now, all full spectrum diodes are heavy on blue because they are blue semiconductors. So if you look at the spectral output sort of diagram of what the diodes produce, they all have a strong peak at 450 nanometers because they're using 450 nanometer semiconductors to create the light sort of in the first place, right? Um, and then they'll have a secondary peak out usually at 650, 660 in the high 600s there which is where most of the photons got sort of filtered to as they pass through the, the phosphor. Um, but some photons will land in the middle in the sort of green and yellow spectrum. So, it, you know, as you're throwing a bunch of photons out towards the high 600s, you end up with some in the 400 or the high 400s, 500s, low 600s even out to the 700s and, and sort of beyond, some photons get sort of slowed down more, or not, not slowed down, stripped of more energy. Because um, all photons travel at the speed of light, right? Some like longer wavelength photons travel at the speed of, so they get from like this side of the screen to this side of the screen, like that, right? Just like maybe one wave. Um, like uh, 800 nanometer or, you know, 650 nanometer. But then you get like 450 nanometer, right? Um, 300 nanometer. You have to like start vibrating more in the same space. Now, every single photon gets from here to here in the same amount of time. So if you have to do 20 vibrations, that's more energy than if you only have to do one vibration in that time, right? So blue photons vibrate faster than red photons in, in that case, but they all travel at the speed of light. Um, and so that's one side. They, they, now, light like um, HPS um, or the other 
you know, gas discharge lights, they create light in a different way. They basically heat up elements um, that, that create different gases. Um, and then they bombard those gases with electrons. Um, as the electrons hit different gases, they gain energy. And then as they fall back down to their original energy level, they release photons. And since those collisions happen somewhat chaotically, that, you know, they go to different heights and they fall down at different heights. So it, they create a blend of, of photons across different spectra. Um, and to change the spectrum in gas discharge lighting, you, you change the, the gaseous elements that are going to be vaporized. So, um, you know, sodium and different um, mercury and, and different things can be vaporized and bombarded. That's the way fluorescent lights work too. Fluorescent lights vaporize mercury and then bombard it with photons. And it's the photons sort of hit it, they gain energy. And when a photon or when an electron, sorry, when the electron loses energy, it will release a photon. Um, that energy becomes a photon. So that's one side of it, very different. The other thing we can do with LEDs is we can target spectra. So we can create a diode at 660 nanometers and grow lights all use, not all, but almost all of them use 660 nanometer diodes because you know, the full spectrum are really 450 nanometer diodes that are throwing some portion of their energy out to the red, but not enough. They're strong in blue and sort of weaker in red. So grow light manufacturers add red to their, you know, add specific red diodes, um, which are super efficient. The, the red diodes are only like 70% energy efficient. But since red photons have less energy, you actually get more photons per watt with a red diode than you do with a blue diode. So like the best blue diodes are like 3.2, 3.3, like the best blue diodes, 3.2, 3.3 micromoles of photons per watt of energy. Um, the best red 660 nanometer photons are over four micromoles of photons per watt of energy, um, even though they're less energy efficient. So basically four micromoles worth of red photons have less energy than three micromoles of blue photons. But plants don't really care about that. The plants care about how many photons are hitting them. Plants care less about sort of how much energy is in each individual photon. Plants respond just as well to a red photon as they do to a blue photon. So one thing we're able to do with LEDs is give them more red photons, which we're able to, to create really efficiently um, and, you know, sort of spike our efficiency numbers by, by targeting the red photons with, you know, a specific semiconductor that very efficiently creates those photons and they're not filtered through anything. Um, gas discharge, if you want to change the, the spectrum, you either change the, the elements that are getting heated and that the, the electrons are, are colliding with, or you filter the light with various things. And anytime you filter the light, you lose efficiency. Um, so the ability of LEDs to create any specific spectrum of light is one of LEDs significant advantages really, because we can target things. I think we need to at least mention the other side of this, which is sort of like, what spectrum do we want for different plants? Um, what, what spectrum are we trying to create? And you know, that there's still some really exciting research on that really exciting research into how much far red light might be beneficial for plants, for example. Um, but the best research suggests that plants want at, at least a, a distribution of light energy sources such that, 
you know, the pluripoles weren't terrible in that they did target sort of the 450 and the 650 um, ranges. So they weren't sort of just drilling in on one uh, photo system. Um, they're activating both. And, it, you know, plants do better really with a full spectrum light, but they're most photosynthetically responsive to the blue light and to the red light. Adding green and yellow light, the primary importance of that is for us as growers to be able to see our plants better. If we grow just under blurple, blue and, and red light, it's really hard to identify like plant nu nutrient deficiencies, pest issues, overall plant health issues, because you just don't get to see your plant very well. But in terms of photosynthetic response, plants grown under blurple lights do pretty well vis-a-vis um, -vis plants grown under full spectrum lights during vegetative growth. Um, plants grown under monochromatic light, so only blue or only red light, don't do very well during vegetative growth. During flowering or reproductive growth, for most plants, there's less significance on spectrum. Um, more significance on flux. So how much light the plant is harvesting as opposed to what specific sort of qualities the lights are. I know a lot of growers think that the specific spectrum that you give, especially during the flowering phase, is going to be sort of the key to harvest quality or to getting the best out of your plants. We don't have really any scientific research to, to support those beliefs. All the research that's been done on, on flowering plants and altering the spectrum really suggests that altering the spectrum has almost no impact on, on harvest yield or harvest quality. We do know that during vegetative growth, plants will respond differently to red heavy spectra versus blue heavy spectra. So if we red shift our, our vegetating light, then the plants will grow lankier. Um, evolutionarily, red light is usually filtered through something. So it sends a signal to the plants that you're growing under somebody else. You better kind of get taller and get up above them. Um, so they, they try to stretch more often in a way that we as growers don't want, they become too sort of stretched out and lanky. So, so we don't want to put them under too much red light. That's why back in the days that we did HPS and, and metal halide, we'd veg under metal halide. It's not because metal halide were better. It's because metal halide have less red in them and the plants wouldn't sort of grow too much. A lot of growers got the idea that we switched to HPS because like HPS was better spectrum for flowering. That's really not true. HPS are more efficient than metal halide. Um, and plants don't really care what spectrum they're flowered under. So if we veg plants under HPS, they would grow too lanky. So that was the problem. So we'd veg plants under metal halide and then we'd switch them to HPS because HPS is more efficient, not necessarily because it's going to produce sort of better harvest quality. It would produce higher yields, but the higher yield was because of the increase in efficiency um, for the same sort of wattage output. Um, so I, I just want to say that we want to distribute the light understanding something about spectrum, especially during vegetative plants, vegetating growth is important. But I think a lot of growers sort of think that there's some magic in spectrum during flowering. We don't have anything in sort of the scientific data that suggests that that's really the case. This clip is brought to you by AC Infinity. Use discount code MrGrow at 15 to save on any of their products. Thank you.